I'm going to begin with a poem. Hi God, it's me again. And I was wondering, does anyone ever ask how you are doing? I mean, we praise your name, say a prayer, but does anyone ever ask, how are you? Are you happy in how you see life on earth? The creation that only you can give birth to? Are you ever mad with how the flesh is always in a mess, not caring where we might end up, and when we're sometimes the key to our own stress? Are you ever sad when someone loses faith, doubting, insecure, constantly showing hate? Do you ever feel bad? Are you ever upset when we're not grateful for what we have? You constantly shower down blessings and even favor. You shower down love, let your son be our savior. But is there ever enough time to ask, how are you? When we want so much happiness, and we want you to take us so far in this life, in this world, but is it enough? If we don't know how you are, how to love like you because you're our guiding star. Well, God, I am sorry. I apologize if I don't ask how you are. Constantly say I. I'm sorry for any ungratefulness. I'm sorry if you are disappointed in how I live. I'm sorry for not showing love and sharing the favor that you give. Saying thank you will never be enough, and neither will saying I'm sorry. I can praise you with a thousand tongues, but it will never be enough time to talk to you. Throughout my living days, I'm sorry I'm always talking and not listening to what you have to say. I will strive to be better, to have open ears, heart, and mind. And I will make more time to ask you, how are you doing?
So what happens is, if you have to trust in your life when you worship with God, and Tila is about to get her master's degree in about a week and a half. And as a part of you realize, God, you are awesome. You are good. And that's really what just happened in singing it. Come on, y'all. Hallelujah.
Um, and I will say this now. This is what I kept telling them last night. If I don't remember the moves, they don't know the song. So y'all aren't going to know if I did anything right or wrong. So if you see me do something different, just go with it. You know? See what? Do they have the song? Okay. You got to pull up your phone, um, Taylor, please. This is what happens on Sunday sometimes. Sometimes the best laid plans of mice and men. My mother used to say that when I was younger. And I used to look at her and go, what does mice have anything to do with anything? Okay, that's fine. Um, while I have the mic, and I tell them this on Sunday, you guys should never give me the mic, because that means anything is liable to come out of my mouth. And that means that I can do all the talking and nobody else can interrupt me. Um, this semester has been a whirlwind for us. I think Reverend Douglas and I only really get to see and hug each other on Sundays. Like we see each other in passing on Mondays and Wednesdays, but the life, uh, the college life has kind of attached itself to us. The last, this past, these past two semesters actually, where we've had some things planned and some programs in place, and then we just got to a place where we said, you know what, we can't do it all. So we have given authority to the students. And um, I know that Pastor Michelle, I know you were like, who was that student calling me? Yeah, I just gave him my phone. It was just like, look, this is the day, this is what we need to do. I need you to take care of it because I got bills to pay. And that works with them. Um, but even with our, our rehearsals, um, our rehearsals are Monday and Wednesday at seven. And I have to combine, because I've tried making it on another day, but it doesn't always work with them. And I want them to fully have the college experience. I don't want to obligate them to church because I want it to be a choice. Does that make sense? Which that's how it is in our life. God wants him, God wants us to choose him. So I want to make the time available and accessible to them so that they can freely choose and don't feel like, oh, I have to do this grudgingly or of necessity. Y'all have heard that before. For God love the cheerful giver. Just kind of weave some scripture in there. Um, so our rehearsals are Abadah and the musicians around 7. Somehow, sometime between 8 o'clock, 8.45 and 9 o'clock maybe, we have Bible study. And we have an intention of only having a 15 minute Bible study. But it gets so intense. And by, what I mean by intense is that we... It's not like Bible school where you know what age group you have and you know what they've been exposed to, so you kind of know where to go. With campus ministries, everybody is in a different place. So there has to be a lot of avenues for the Bible study to travel because I want to make sure that everyone leaves learning something. I have people who've never been to church before. I have people who've never considered reading the Bible. I have people who've been to church their entire lives, but gone because they were made to go. And I have people who go to church because they really want to be there. I have people that just came for the Bible study, but know in order for them to get through practice, I won't let them get up. I have, I have students from, uh, like, across the gambit in terms of experience level. So we try to make it about 15 minutes. And I have to apologize to Kara, and there are about maybe nine of them, because sometimes their rehearsals are slighted. But if it's slighted for Bible study, I'm not upset. And neither are they. So today, the song that we will be rendering is called Incredible God, Incredible Praise. Um, sometimes, and if I could just make this, give this an analogy, you know when you go to a restaurant, you kind of gauge the waitress. In my head, I already have a number of how much I've allotted for, so I know just how much I can spend of my husband's money. Uh, you know, I have, an, I know that if I'm gonna order this, 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 and this, I could probably give her ten dollars. So I always tell the waitress, "You're gonna get a certain amount." Now I need you to keep up with that amount. And you know, if my cup is looking a little empty, and you know, if, if they seem to be attentive elsewhere, if they seem to have a chip on their shoulder. I never, I never take away from the tip if the food isn't right because they weren't in the kitchen, you know. But then, at the end, sometimes I go, wow, she did a great job. I really want to bless her with more. 
and I can wait till he walks away from the table and I'll put a couple more zeros on there, okay? But your relationship with God shouldn't be like that. We should gauge just how much he does in our life and then say, this is how much time I'm gonna devote to him because I didn't really hit the lottery this week. This is how much time I know. This is how much praise I'm gonna give him. But this is what I'm gonna devote, devote to prayer. Or this is what I'm gonna devote to worship. Because eh, he was so so. The idea is that if he's woke, he woke you up this morning. That's incredible praise enough. If he started you on your way, as my grandmother would say, or even the fact that you have wherewithal with limbs, or you woke up in your right mind or there's still heat in your home, or air conditioning in your home, or your car still runs, or if you've still been given another day and another, another opportunity to repent and get it right, that's incredible praise in God. So I hope this song renders to you in such a way that your measurement changes and how you qualify God changes. Because truly, there's no comparison. I just told him if I look a little tired, he's trying to drink on the dance. Just pass it to him. They don't know if it's part of the dance or not.
technical difficulties squared away and then we can dance after the, after the uh, message. And that way the time, whatever it is, the time that it has to take while we're figuring it out, we can, we can go for it. Amen. Praise God. It's an incredible God and an incredible praise. And we're thankful for this ministry and for all of the hard work. Um, it's just amazing. This is, of course, the end of the semester. There's a lot going on. Let us pray. Father God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to permeate our hearts and our lives. And Lord, to unite us, not only during this time of worship, but Lord, that you would unite us in all of the ways that we can be members of your kingdom throughout the week and throughout our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our God, and our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's hear a word of scripture from Acts the 8th chapter, verses 26 through 40. And I will be reading from the New Living Translation. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south, down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the candle, or the candice, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, Well, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same description, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. It will serve us for a message entitled, Peanut Butter and Jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. You know, there are some things in life that just seem to go together. There are some pairs 
that it would be almost impossible to speak of one without the other. Bonnie and Clyde, <laughs> Howard and Dorothy, Romeo and Juliet. And then there's some things that we are used to seeing on a daily basis that it's hard to think about without the other. Macaroni and Ice and <laughs> Ice and water. Okay, here's one. Cake and There we go, there we go, there we go. And of course, some of everybody's favorite. Everybody loves. I mean everybody loves. What was that? Peanut butter. <laughs> and oh my god, digging in this cat. Oh. And jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. Quick word, y'all know Welch's grape jelly was invented by Memphis? Yeah, yeah. Welch's grape juice was invented by a Methodist who wanted to have something in the community that did not have alcohol. So they took the juice and made it. That, that's, that's, a, that, that's, that's Provenient grace right there. That's grace. That's grace. That's grace. That's grace. That's grace. <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. But you know the interesting thing about peanut butter and jelly? If you were to try to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, interestingly enough, we can make it with the ingredients, but if I were really trying to make it, I need this, right? You gotta have bread, which is your foundational element. You have to have bread, the bread of, okay, okay, yeah. But what if we tried to make peanut butter and jelly without the process necessary for peanut butter and jelly to be made individually? What if we tried to make peanut butter and jelly with this?
faces that are brown in the Greek. If you were to look at those two, even in first century Palestine, you would not have seen how they could have been together. The eunuch couldn't have had children, and therefore, in some circles, wouldn't have been allowed to come and worship fully. He could have been a proselytized, and, and he went to Jerusalem to worship, but there's something about his status as a eunuch that probably made him not fully inclusive into the life of the community. The eunuch was also, even though he was in that situation, as a treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia, he had a level of social power that perhaps Philip wouldn't have had. Philip had power in the church, so to speak, as a deacon, one of seven selected to serve. The Ethiopian eunuch had power in the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. Interestingly enough, the text from Isaiah that the eunuch was reading talked about the fact that he, what, had no descendants. I believe the Ethiopian eunuch can identify with that because there would not have been a way for him to have children to have any descendants. So what does all of this have to do? God took two individuals, two men who were men in very distinct ways from two very distinct different walks of life and by the power of the Holy Spirit took two people who were different in all sorts of categorical ways, different ethnically, different socially, different in some of the other biological ways, different in how their families would have been structured. And by the power of this Holy Spirit, the one thing that connected them was their desire for God. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Philip had already been blessed by the power working within the early church. Those two men who would have otherwise not been compatible by the power of the Holy Spirit were able to come together on a particular period of time in a particular place in history and through God's grace put their differences aside and have worshipped them. The area where they found themselves and you notice in the story that as things are working, Philip, it says that Philip baptized the eunuch. But you know who I really think was baptized in this story? Philip. Notice that when we look at the text, Philip doesn't initiate any of this interaction. He simply follows the move of the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord told him to go down to the, to the Gaza, Jerusalem and Gaza. And then the angel of the Lord or the Holy Spirit told him to go over and speak to the youth. I wonder if had it not been for God's grace moving Philip in the direction that he went, perhaps he would have just noticed this Ethiopian eunuch and would have never said anything to him. The Holy Spirit, in my impression, since that time has been moving and calling people who were different in all kinds of categorical ways, throughout all of the walks of history, I think the Holy Spirit has always been speaking to people who were different to come together under the sound of my name and my gospel and worship together and be baptized with one another. The common denominator in this process is water. And if anybody knows how you go from this to what we talked about. You know how to make peanut butter from peanuts? First take them out of the shell. <laughs> <laughs> There's some things about us when it comes to meeting folks who are different, and I'm talking about all kinds of difference. There are some things about us that sometimes will harden us so that it's difficult for us to work together. We've got to take these nuts out of their shell, you cannot make peanut butter with the shells on, trust me. You have to crack the nut out of the shell, and then you've got to put it in a blender, or a mixer, or a food processor, and you've got to work that thing. You've got to work it. You've got to work it. 
You even can put, if you want to, just a hair bit of water and a little bit of olive oil or whatever kind of oil you like and just keep working it. And if you keep working it, you keep working it with the, with the water, you keep working it with the oil. Come on, somebody. We keep working with baptism. The Lord anoints us. We keep working it. We keep working. We keep praying. We keep trusting God in the midst of things that look difficult. We keep allowing God to work through the hard shell that's on the outside of us. We keep allowing God to stretch us beyond what we think we can do. And you finally get peanut butter. Something like that with sugar to it. A little honey to it. Sweeten it up a little bit. Amen? How do you make jelly? <laughs> Similar process. You got to take the grapes off of their vine. You've got to separate the grapes because you know there are no vines in jelly. You have to take the grapes off of those things which it is traditionally attached to that makes it feel like if I'm not attached to what I'm normally attached to, I will not be able to, to survive or live. You have to take the nut out of the shell. You have to take the grapes off of the vine. Put it in, yes, a blender or a food processor and cut it on and continue to allow it to spin. And what it will do with that grape, it will continue to mash that grape down, it will continue to, to press upon it, it will continue to press upon it, it will reform it, it will refine it, it will reshape it until it is an absolutely new thing. And so when we get these two elements that seem to be distinctly separate, that we know without going through the process, will not be able to be formed in a sandwich. We have to keep working those things and working those things. And when we work them enough, and probably add a little pectin to the grapes, we end up with those world-famous elements of But here's the thing that I love the most. You can have, and, but if you want to make a sandwich, you gotta have. Try to eat these two things separately without bread and see what kind of mix you make. I've tried it and it does not, but you can't. So here's the thing. We are told through our scriptures that Jesus is the bread. You know what happens when you take people who are different in all kinds of ways, but have been influenced and fed with the bread of life? The bread of life is the foundation that we can come together and worship with all of our differences, with all of the things that we, even, even within homogenous groups, there are differences, right? We come together and we trust the bread of life to be the foundation for which we lay our respective gifts together for the purpose of making something that we can taste and see. <laughs> Everywhere. 
But with all of the stuff that goes on in our world, with all of the ways that we continuously hear about differences and, and bring differences up, what a blessing it is that we have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who brings us together for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of praise, and for the purpose of gifting to the world a combination that makes us so much better together than who we would be apart. I give God grace and thanks and appreciation for the process that is going on by the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives. May we be peanut butter and jelly as our Lord continues to be bread for the world. Amen? I bless you.
to come and worship. Not just to come and worship, but to bring their gifts and fully put themselves out there to glorify your name and build your kingdom. Thank you in the busyness of their lives. In, in the days where they're going, oh my goodness, if I don't get this right this week, I might not pass. I might not get the grade. I might not get the paper. But God, we believe that you restore to them what they have given to you in greater fullness than they can even begin to imagine. God, bless them and anoint them with your spirit that they might be successful in all the things that you've called them to. Bless them, Lord, in their studies in their friendships, in their lives, in their loves, in their families, in all that you do in their lives. Bless them mightily. Thank you, God. And I pray your blessings on each one of us. We're students still, still too, Lord. We're still students of life. We're students of your spirit. We're students of Jesus Christ. And we have a lot to learn yet. So give us that same anointing, God, that we might study you and that we might be immersed in you. Not because we have to get the grade, because you already made the grade for us. Freedom. Freedom from sin. But because you gave us freedom for sin, from sin, we are free to live for your kingdom. So God, use us. Use this church. Use us in the coming days and weeks and months. Uh, especially with all the events that we have going on. God, with all the needs there in our church and in our community that, that really demand the use of all your gifts. Use the gifts that we have to honor you. And God, for those in this church community and in our circle of loved ones and even in places uh, among people whose faces we'll never see, whose names we'll never know, but who are also sons and daughters of the Most High, bring your healing touch, we pray. Yeah. Bring your forgiving arms of mercy. Bring your love. Bring your fullness into their lives. Bless us now, Lord, as we um, as we continue to worship you, not just in this place, but in every place, in every situation. Bless us now. We give you all the honor and the glory and praise that you are due. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. You're perfect. 